Chapter 18, Black and White. After halting Kotaro's plans, Korn stops in the neutral land of Izumo to rest. However, not everything is what it seems. Right. Nice to meet ya! Thank you. Come on now! Well... I am Izana. Yes, the Izana! No, no, no. Oh, wow. Well. <laughs> Everyone. Stand down. <gasps> In the vanilla game, this encounter is complete happenstance. Corn has nothing to do with it. That's right. How very amusing. What did you say? <laughs> you! I welcome the challenge.
Well, well. I'm so sorry. Listen up. Everything's okay. Right. Um... Hey! Not enough. Yes. You! now what listen up
be. Understood. For peace and honor, we're casting our lot with the Hoshiden royals against Zola and his troops, who now occupy Izumo Castle. This is a defeat all bosses mission with a 20 turn time limit. We have three commanders to kill, the first being Zola himself. Zola wields Nosferatu and Ragnarok, and his skills are Vengeance, which doesn't work with Nosferatu, Even Handed, and Duelist Blow. His fellow commanders are a paired-up duo of generals guarding the Hoshiden royal family. Both of them have Warding Blow and Wary Fighter. They each carry a special enemy-only 1-2 range weapon, a Silver Javelin for one and a Silver Star Axe for the other. When you defeat the generals, the door to this room will open. Sadly, you can't interact with Ryoma, Hinoka, Takumi, or Sakura in any way. The enemies won't try to attack them either. Our spawn points are evenly split on either side of the castle, seven in the west, where corn is forced to start, and seven in the east. That's an unsubtle suggestion to split your army, which is exactly what we're going to do. The two different entrances on each wing create a further division between north and south, where the enemy compositions are very different. Broadly speaking, this map comprises four quadrants. The upper left quadrant is populated with heroes. They're the easiest enemies to handle. One major reason for that is that the heroes have limited attacking options. They have no ranged weapons whatsoever, and they only have 6 movement, so they're not likely to outmaneuver you. Statistically, the heroes are solid, but unexceptional. They're neither super strong, nor super fast, nor super bulky. And their skills aren't all that important. The most consequential one is Duelist Blow, which is annoying, but not hard to play around. What makes them especially easy to beat is the obvious choke point in the western doorway. That entrance is covered by a maid with Enfeeble, and also a strategist with Freeze. But even with those status stabs in play, most units can do fine by holding the choke point and playing conservatively. If you're trying to go faster, it is somewhat difficult to wipe out several heroes in a row on a single enemy phase. That usually requires you to have high attack power, speed, and bulk all at the same time, and you'll probably have to do something to neutralize the maid. The upper right section tends to be a little scarier. It's not as easy to pull these sorcerers into a choke point because of the way their ranges overlap, particularly for the four sorcerers farthest from the entrances, who are all supported by another enfeebled maid. The only enemy in the main group who can easily be lured out on his own is this one. You can also fight the one in the eastern treasure room from outside the castle if you wish. If you wish to engage the main sorcerer squad on enemy phase, you must be prepared to take several powerful hits, and you have to worry about two sorcerers in particular. The one with Lightning, which strikes twice in a row when the user initiates combat, and the one with Mjolnir, which has a high crit rate and deals quadruple damage when it crits. One method to overcome these enemies is to stack resistance, often on the likes of Kaze or Leo. If you're taking 8 damage from Mjolnir without a crit, it's terrifying. If you're taking 2, it's no more impressive than Fimblefeder or Ragnarok. Beware of seal resistance, though. If your res tank of choice can't kill the sorcerers in just one round of combat, they won't be a res tank for long. Rather than stacking res, we'll use a different method to beat these sorcerers. We'll get into that later. 
In the back room by Zola, there's a pair of heroes and a pair of sorcerers. They support each other with their skills. The heroes have seal resistance, and the sorcerers have seal defense. So if you miss a kill on one pair, you'll be weaker to the other. The bottom right part of the stage is dominated by cavalry in the form of paladins and bow knights. These are similar to the heroes in that they have unexceptional combat stats, but the mounted units have ranged options with their bows and spears. They also carry a few effective weapons, a beast killer and an armor slayer. These enemies are highly mobile, and they're not as easy to constrain with choke points as the heroes are. That's partly because their initial attack ranges don't extend to the entrances, so you can't pull them through the doorways on turn one. The other major factor is that those initial ranges coincide with the strategist's freeze range. You can't simply stand on a tile that's barely in reach and then run backwards on turn two, because the strategist can catch you out. The bottom left area has several generals. These generals are strong and durable, and they have an assortment of good weapons, but they're not all that threatening overall. Some of them have Wary Fighter, which makes it hard to chew through their HP super efficiently. That often requires tag team setups, perhaps with a bolt axe in front to be able to counter spears, and a hammer in back. But you don't have to be fancy. Any sturdy Wyvern Lord or other axe user with a hammer equip can handle the generals just fine with little more than a pair-up partner. The strategist might freeze you, but that's mainly just a nuisance, especially if you stay inside the narrow entranceway. Our answer for the heroes won't be a unit who doubles them. Instead, Gunter will support Dragonkorn in his last hurrah. The Dragonstone still works great against enemies who are locked to melee range. Selina, Laszlo, and Silas, together with Camilla, will handle the armored units in the southwest. For the sorcerers, we have Jacob. He gets weapon triangle advantage with daggers and shurikens, he has decent strength and speed with all his buffs, and he has Tome Breaker, which should help him dodge all or nearly all of their attacks. Given the right support partner, he should be a great counter for them, albeit not a perfect one. Percy and Shura will mostly act in utility and support roles at first, but they will have some chances to participate in combat themselves. They both need to build support with Korn. Keaton will be working with Mozu for most of the mission. Early on, Charlotte will principally act as support for Xander, who will be our primary counter to the enemy cavalry. But those roles will reverse towards the end, since we have a duty to train Charlotte, too. We have to make a few adjustments to our initial positioning before we start. Most saliently, Percy and Camilla are both on the wrong side of the map. We also need to give Charlotte a Master Steel. Her choice between Berserker and Hero is no contest at all. Hero is a bad fit. Charlotte won't make very good use of its skills, and in pair up, it lacks the gigantic strength bonus offered by fighters and berserkers. The purpose of training Charlotte up to level 13 when she joined was to give her some extra stats that could make her reasonably competent after an early promotion without significantly compromising her experience gain afterwards. Her internal level will only be one higher than if she had promoted instantly at level 10, so Charlotte will still learn new skills quickly. That means we can count on having rally strength pretty soon. Upon pairing our new Berserker to Xander, we should be ready. As our first move, Korn pairs into Gunter, and then Selina rallies for him. That improves Korn's defense stat, which is crucial for his upcoming enemy phase. Note that we did not want Selina to boost Camilla's defenses, for reasons we'll see in a minute. Here we go. Please, accept my help. You have my support. We've united Camilla with Silas, who can now head southeast toward the strategist. We'd want to kill her, but Camilla can't do that very reliably. 
It would take her two hits to do so, and she doesn't have great hit rates. We don't want to rely on those. As an alternative, Camilla can first attack the Spear General with her hammer. That won't kill either, but it will activate Savage Blow, reducing the strategist's HP to a point where Camilla can kill with only one hit, rather than two. Selena can finish off that general with her javelin. We're not alone. Told you I was tough. Like Camilla, Selena can counterattack and kill the strategist on enemy phase. Due to a combination of skill and weapon triangle effects, that strategist will prefer to target Camilla. Percy separates Jacob from Azura, so that they'll both be available on our next turn. And then Gudru drops Corrin into the entrance by the heroes. Corrin can't be reached by this paladin down south, nor by this sorcerer or hero up north. Only four heroes are in range. Those four heroes only have to move five tiles at most to attack Corrin. That means that if Corrin weren't in the way, they could also reach Gunter. As we discussed way back in Chapter 9, the AI staff targeting algorithm works by first checking which targets can be attacked by the greatest number of allies, without consideration for other units that might be in the way. The maid believes that Corrin and Gunter can both be hit by exactly four of her teammates, so between them, she picks whichever target has the least staffable. That's Gunter. So Corrin gets to keep four defense and four magic for this turn. Gunter might lose 4 strength, but that only translates into a loss of 2 damage on his dual strikes, and it's fairly easy to compensate for that. Just my Over in the east, we do want to take out the closest sorcerer. That's Shura's responsibility, but he can't kill the enemy on his own, so someone else has Don't to help him. Dumb. In some respects, it's convenient that Shura supports no one other than Korin. He can freely team up with anyone else without affecting their support needs. You have my aid. Xander will wait here, where several enemies can attack him. The stairs prevent elbow room from working, but between Xander's base strength, Charlotte's 5 point strength bonus, a strength boosting meal, the raw might of Siegfried, Xander's sword rank, and his personal skill, he can still one shot the Bow Knights. We're also looking for him to kill the Spear Paladin, whom he will double, and we want him to weaken but not kill the other Paladins who can attack him at melee range. This Paladin can reach Selina and Camilla in addition to Xander. Left to his own devices, he'd prefer not to fight Camilla because she kills him, but we want to change his mind. Your time. Yep. A seventy percent displayed hit rate with two chances to work is not bad at all. Just in time. Uh, no! Glad that's over with. This general occupies the only tile from which the central paladin can attack Selina, so that paladin's choices are reduced to either Camilla or Xana. And when this general's attack lands, the paladin will see lethal damage on Camilla. That will override his instinct not to attack someone who kills him on the counterattack. That's what we planned for, but this outcome wasn't guaranteed. Both enemies had to hit Camilla, one with 82% displayed accuracy and one with only 70%. This is another dicey moment in our opening turn. Once we get past this first Duelist Blow hero, our accuracy will improve dramatically. The other hero with Duelist Blow is the one who's dual striking. You have my support. Watch out! 
How'd you do that? I live to serve. I can always count on you. This is my chance. Draconic Hex heals every stat, strength, magic, skill, speed, luck, defense, and resistance, by 4 points after battle. It's usually not a great skill, because any trained Corrin can probably just reduce the enemy HP to 0 instead of cutting their stats by 4, but we will definitely have uses for it. How disappointing. You're not alone! Just in time! Stay strong! Glad that's over with. Xander's accuracy in this battle is pretty bad. Fortunately, the rest of the incoming cavalry units won't be able to use the stairs against him. One difficulty we have when using Siegfried is that there's no way to eliminate its crit chance. That can lead to undesirable outcomes, so there will be times when we equip Xander with a Kodachi instead, just to prevent untimely crits. We'll be fine. Oh. Uh, ah! hmm. Over. Turn 1 was a complete success. Turn 2 shouldn't require quite as much luck. It will require Selena and Camilla to pull back temporarily. They'll leave the remaining generals for later. Selena can rally for several units, most importantly Gunter and Jacob. By passing off Laszlo first, she allows him to rally too. Stiff upper lip. We won't After Laszlo's buffs, Korn and Gunter can take out the fifth hero together. Since the Leaven Sword is weaker than the Dragonstone, Gunter sometimes has to equip a stronger weapon. The Forge Steel Lance is less accurate than the Iron Sword plus two, so it has a tiny chance to miss. Not to worry though, Azura will pair up with Gunter anyway, and that gives Gunter a five point hit bonus if she does it before Korn attacks. We've got this. Age before beauty. A great mistake. I can always count on you. Instead of going northwest, Camilla will head northeast, where she can drop Silas near the left hand maid. Silas can also be attacked by the southernmost sorcerer. The maid and the sorcerer could combine to kill him if it weren't for a vow of friendship. The maid will act first, and then because the sorcerer won't see a kill on Silas, he'll target Camilla instead. At the moment, that would also be lethal, so Jacob must heal her. I'm here to help! Reminds me of the old days. After Azura sings to Jacob, he'll be ready to take on the other sorcerers. Percy provides three strength and also one point of movement, with which Jacob can barely reach the right hand maid. Well, I'll some. The paired up heroes and sorcerers won't be able to reach him there, and they won't move just to provide yeah. dual strikes, so after he kills the maid, Jacob will only face the solo sorcerers. It wasn't certain that Jacob would be able to one round the maid. To achieve this benchmark without rally strength using a Wyvern Lord partner, Jacob had to gain at least one point of strength in his five levels, an overall probability of about 92%. If he hadn't, we would have been forced to spend 3000 gold on an Iron Dagger plus two. The downside of using the Steel Shuriken is that it requires an eight speed margin to follow up. 
Jacob currently beats the sorcerers by 11, but after he gets hit by the maid's silver dagger, his speed will be cut by 4 points, and he won't double the sorcerers anymore. Fortunately, I happen to know that Jacob will gain speed when he levels up, so he doesn't need a tonic to correct this problem. We can take these goons! I could do no less. This won't do. This wasn't a deliberate gambit to skimp on tonics. In fact, I'm trying not to purposely abuse predetermined growth to save money. Rather, I was being extremely cautious because I didn't want to give Jacob too much speed by accident. The hit rates the enemy sorcerers have on Jacob will be in the low single digits. They drop 10 points due to cancelled weapon rank bonuses, they lose 10 more against B rank weapon triangle disadvantage, and then there's Tonebreaker, all on top of Jacob's displayed avoid. If Jacob were to gain too much speed and luck when he levels up in this chapter, their accuracy could drop to zero. That would be a disaster, so my first priority was to ensure that Jacob's speed would not be any higher than it had to be. On the right, we have four paladins to deal with. Shura won't directly help with that. Instead, he'll go west to separate Gunther from Azura, dropping him to the south, where Gunther protects him from the paladins. Gunther has equipped his Beast Killer to deter them. The position of the Armor Slayer Paladin with respect to the Beast Killer Paladin is random. They can each be in either spot. We'll kill one of them on this player phase, but that's not always going to be the one who's close enough to reach Gunther, hence the need for Gunther to have the Beast Killer. Yeah, I got you. Praise. This could be tough. The paladin we want to eliminate is, counterintuitively, the armor slayer one. We're happy to leave the beast killer guy alive because Keaton can distract him very easily. In fact, Keaton takes so much more damage than everyone else that we can expose Charlotte, and we can even get away with leaving Mozu in range with a bow equipped. Keaton doesn't kill the paladin even with Mozu's support. If he did, the enemy's targeting priorities would change. Let's do this. I was so frightened. I'll take care of this. That's my turn. Thank you. Without the default 10 point hit bonus and tag teams, this sorcerer wouldn't be able to hit Jacob at all. But under the circumstances, he definitely could have. In this game, displayed hit rates of 50% or less are totally honest. There is a genuine 7% chance for Jacob to get hit, which would be very bad, and a small chance for him to outright die. Another issue is Jacob's crit chance. On this enemy phase, crits wouldn't make a difference, but they can and will be a huge problem in the future, primarily because they can mess up the guard gauge. Jacob just gained both speed and luck for the second level in a row. If I had naively given him a speed tonic and a luck tonic to max out his avoid, this next sorcerer wouldn't attack him then. Stand back, citizen! Back, even short! Careful out there! We've made tremendous progress in the north, but the job is far from over. Next, we'll engage the paired-up enemies by Zola. 
Doing so will trigger reinforcements from the nearby stairs, so we'll have to be ready for them. Shura needs at least one support point with Corin to reach B rank on schedule. We can work on that while we set ourselves up against the reinforcements by placing Corin in a position where he can dual strike for Shura. Corin equips fire before he drops Gunter. Here, he's at the far end of Shura's movement range. We all die eventually. Here I am. This is my job. Jacob may have gained two points of speed, but he has lost his buffs from Azura and Laszlo, so he no longer doubles the sorcerers. Azura has to rectify that. Also, note that because Jacob finally gained a second point of strength, he can now kill sorcerers in two hits without Laszlo's fancy footwork. If he hadn't done that, we would have to make an adjustment to get help from Laszlo again, or else we would have had to forge the Iron Dagger plus two anyway. You have my support. We can do this. Stiff up a lip. When Jacob attacks the lead hero, we're praying for him not to crit, or else our support and experience routing will be seriously disrupted. Justice never loses! Together we shall if we wanted to, we could block the stairways to prevent the reinforcements from spawning, but that's something we never want to do in this challenge. Failing that, two heroes will emerge from the left-hand stairway, and two sorcerers will appear from the right. We're already prepared to deal with three of those. Silas and Camilla should stay close enough to help against the fourth enemy, but that doesn't preclude them from going southeast to take on the general there. More pests. Careful out there! From here, if Silas rides eight spaces to the north, he'll be able to throw his javelin at the rightmost sorcerer. In the west, it's time for Laszlo and Selina to team up against the remaining generals. Laszlo will start by hitting the closest one with his armor slam, weakening him to a point where Selina can finish him off. Although we'd like Laszlo's dual strikes against the next two generals to deal a non-zero amount of damage, we want that number to be as small as possible. The bronze bow will suffice. To shield Laszlo from said generals, Selina has to lunge this one. She uses the hand axe for weapon triangle advantage, which is important because it reduces the damage she'll take. Like I'd lose. This general can't reach Laszlo anymore. On the right side of the stage, we'd prefer to give this kill to Charlotte. That's a more complicated proposition than it looks. Charlotte can kill the Paladin by herself, but she'll be more accurate if she does that in a tag team rather than having Xander in back. Also, when you're getting frozen over and over, you want to have an unpaired unit next to you when your turn is over, so that you can still move. And we're trying to build support between Charlotte and Xander, not Charlotte and Mozu or Charlotte and Keaton, so we'd probably like Xander to be her dual striker. We could achieve all that by doing the following. First, Mozu pulls Xander, she switches, Xander drops her to the south, and then Charlotte attacks the Paladin using Xander's support. But that would be a mistake. It would prevent Mozu from activating Profiteer, because getting dropped is not a turn ending action. Instead, Charlotte must use Mozu's support. Can we do this? Did I do that? Well, of course. Now Mozu can step to the south and drop Xander. Lastly, Keaton marches to a position where he can support Mozu against the Strategist on our next player phase.
Against these heroes, Jacob must hit, and he can't crit. Against the sorcerers, a crit on Jacob's first counterattack would also be bad. He needs to be able to fill his guard gauge with one attack next turn. All clean. Well, how irksome. Happily, Jacob gets a temporary reprieve from his woes with crit chances because he doesn't have to kill these sorcerers. He just needs to weaken the one on the stairs. Allow me to join you. Allow me to join you. For Gunther to kill that sorcerer, Jacob has to equip the Steel Shuriken again. Be steadfast. Ah! You must go. Ah! Well done. Before Korin goes anywhere, Shura uses him to kill the leftmost hero. I'll protect you. Oh, we're not done yet. Oh. Respect your elders. Let's now Korn can take out the other hero with help from Gunther. We already know they can do this, but they both need better weapons. The Love and Sword is preferable because it can't crit, although technically the Dragonstone has a higher success rate because it doesn't always rely on Gunter's door strike. How'd you do that? By killing that hero, we've opened up another tile next to Jacob, where Azura can sing to him. She's sending him right back into Zola's room. Jacob will finish off the sorcerer, leaving only the heroes. That sorcerer has a 2% hit rate because he gets two adjacency bonuses. If his partner had decided to attack Jacob from any other square, he would have 0% instead. As is, Jacob's not totally immune to him, but his chances of dodging are pretty good. We can take these goons! No oh. ah, surprise there. That leaves the one sorcerer on the right for Silas and Camilla. This could be trouble. Together we shall prevail. Not to worry. I won't fail again. After killing that strategist, Mozu's in range of one paladin. Keaton can prepare her for enemy phase simply by changing her weapon. Oh, what a pain in the butt! Together. Xander's objective for the next several turns is to team up with Laszlo to whittle down the remaining generals. That way, they can both get a bunch of support points and experience. To facilitate that, Selena must pull the generals to the east without hurting them too badly in the process. Go, go! They deal 10 damage to her, so if Selena hadn't dodged an attack earlier, she would have to use her vulnerary now to ensure her own survival. Just for the sake of demonstration, she'll do that anyway. Both generals can hit Selena from two sides, so there's no way they can body block each other. Of course, at the moment they would rather just kill Laszlo. He needs to hide behind Selena.
we are still rooting against our own crit chances. Champions of justice. Phew. We're almost out of the woods, but not yet. If Mozu or Keaton were to have a critical hit here, that wouldn't be a problem. It might affect their experience a little bit, but not enough to matter. We have a little more cleanup to do before we fight Zola. Korin and Shura start by heading toward the western treasure chest, but we're not ready to open the door yet. Meanwhile, Gunter, Jacob, Azura, and Percy handle the heroes. They have a full guard gauge, so Gunter breaks it. This counts as a second round of combat for Gunter and Jacob. We want the kill experience to go to Percy. To maximize his accuracy, he transfers Jacob away. Percy would rather use bronze than iron for this, but all the bronze axes are already spoken for. Reminds me of the old days. That was lucky! After Azura sings to Gunter, Jacob can weaken the next hero for Percy to kill on enemy phase. Since that hero has a sword, Percy should equip the Dual Club. For Jacob, the Flame Shuriken and the Bronze Dagger are both safe to use. The Bronze Dagger might be slightly better because it reduces the targets of void. Camilla and Silas can dispose of the Sorcerer guarding the Eastern Treasure Room. We can do this together! Thank you. <laughs> Down south, Keaton can deal with his last paladin with help from Mozu. Now Mozu can continue southward. She and Keaton will head to the southern entrance of the castle, near the general bosses. When they get close enough to the commanders, they'll trigger the other wave of reinforcements. Two paladins in the east, and two generals in the west. But that'll take a couple of turns. Before those reinforcements arrive, Xander and Laszlo should engage the generals who are already present. The trick to that is to make sure that both generals can always attack Xander, but never anyone else. For that purpose, Xander waits three spaces east of Selina, or four spaces east of the uppermost general. Laszlo goes east of Xander, where he's protected, and Selina flies even farther east. There she can rally to minimize damage to Xander. We've established another formation where the two generals can hit our tank from two sides, so they can never body block each other. Honestly, I was hoping for a crit from Percy, just for fun. Maybe next time? Over here. 
Soon we'll have Corrin fight Zola. For that to be feasible, Corrin must first be healed. This should be simple. Trust me. We all die eventually. Well, how irksome. Gunter can attempt to use Shura's dual strike against the hero. If Shura were to miss, then Gunter would get to provide another dual strike later when Korn goes for the kill. I got some fight left. We've got this. Allow me to join you. We now have two units paired up outside of a combat zone. A situation that we always prefer to avoid if possible. We've placed Percy in the corner because there's an open space near there. Korn can use that to pair up with him on our next turn. Silas and Camilla are done here. They don't have lock touch, so they can't get the other loot. They should head south. Xander and friends essentially want to repeat their actions from last turn. Xander should be four spaces east of the rightmost general, then Laszlo should be east of Xander, and Selina should be east of Laszlo. This time, Laszlo can also rally. One or two extra damage from Xander won't affect anything important. Charlotte waits below Selina and not east of her to make herself available for dual strikes. Admit it, you need me. Can we do this? We're not alone. <laughs> How about a two-step? <laughs> I won't let you down. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Won't give up. There are a few different tactics that Corrin might use against Zola. One obvious try is to use Percy's nine movement to go straight in and attack with fire, but that's very dangerous. Corrin can't endure two hits, and therefore he can't afford to attack on player phase. His guard gauge isn't full enough to block what would be Zola's second attack on enemy phase, not even if Corrin could double him. Zola would be debuffed by Draconic Hex, but that doesn't stop his second attack from being lethal especially given that he can simply switch to Ragnarok, which is stronger than Nosferatu. So the only safe thing to do is to take the first fight on enemy phase. The problem with enemy phase is that Zola will be much harder to hit then. First, he can and will switch off of Nosferatu, eliminating a 20 point avoid penalty. Second, he gets to use Duelist Blow. In total, his avoid on enemy phase will be 50 points higher than it is now. Even with fire, Korn will be reduced to a pathetic 39 hit. We can't afford to gamble on that, because this isn't just a matter of earning support with Percy and applying Draconic Hex. Korn must hit, so we need to give him the best chances possible. The most accurate weapon Korn can use is a bronze sword. He can pull one out of the convoy. Inspiring Song gives him six more hit and allows him to double Zola. We've got this. Korin now has 95 hit with fire, or 105 with the bronze sword, which translates on enemy phase into two chances to hit at 55% displayed accuracy, only one of which must succeed. Thus, we have more than doubled our success rate from 38% to 82%. The reason why it's so crucial for Korn to land an attack is that he must reach level 7 before chapter 19. We'll do two paralogues between now and then, but he's already overleveled to such a degree that he'll be earning single digit experience from kills in those missions. He needs the XP from fighting and damaging Zola twice to get those levels on time. Age before beauty. 
Gunter's close enough for Shura to reach him. On our next turn, he can help Shura travel to the eastern wing of the castle to retrieve the rest of the loot. We're ready to kill these two generals. We're going to be rather technical about that because we want to give extra experience to Selina. She has to get to level 6, but we'd like her to reach level 7. That can improve her chances of passing bonus stats to her child. On the other hand, we don't want Laszlo to level up. When Selina goes for this kill, she should use Charlotte's support and not Laszlo's. She should also lunge. The Berserker class's innate 20 point crit bonus is fun, but it's more a curse than a blessing, especially for us. Because Selena lunged, Camilla can reach her now. She can hand over the hammer, which Selena and Charlotte now want for themselves. Camilla pairs up with Selena so that Charlotte can use Selena's dual strike. We'll be fine. Selina received just 17 experience points from her kill. That figure was slightly affected by experience decay, but it's clear that she can't reach level 7 purely by killing generic enemies. For his part, Laszlo would get 5 experience just for a single non-lethal dual strike, so that's all he can do for the rest of the mission. Xander takes the javelin, which Selina no longer needs, and he also grabs the hammer for Charlotte. He separates Camilla from Selina. By switching, he allows Camilla to start her next turn farther east. That's helpful because she wants to rejoin Silas, who is waiting by the stairs to meet the paladins. From here, Camilla will be able to attack using Silas's dual strike without Silas having to move first. To wrap up our turn, Mozu and Keaton run northwest, past the general bosses. Note that pairing up is an action that can trigger Profiteer. That's a huge relief. This is the first time we've seen Draconic Hex in action. In this particular situation, it's really helpful. By reducing all of Zola's stats by 4, it cuts his avoid by 8, it makes him take more damage, and it allows Korin to double him without any help from Azura. Speaking of doubling, Korin's follow-up attack nearly filled up his guard gauge. Now he can attack again without fearing any reprisal. But Korn shouldn't use his sword this time. We don't want to give him the kill because we're also trying to feed experience to Percy. Instead, Korn should use fire. Assuming he hits at least once, the experience he earns will put him very close to level 6. We can do this. We've got this. I'm with you. No more hiding. So what's the big hurry in training Don't Percy? Well, the reason for that is bittersweet. This he needs to learn Rally Defense soon, die. because this mission is Selena's retirement party. She's about to complete all of her objectives for the campaign, and these last few turns are her final chance at glory. Sometimes glory consists in really effective rallying, but Selena will do more than that before the end. Xander will fight the Spear General at range using the javelin he got from Selina. This time, he'll use Charlotte's support instead of Laszlo's. While she's here, she should grab the hammer. Oh, 
I won't leave you. I'll play with you. Camilla can lunge this paladin off the stairs to make him easier for Silas to kill. She'll also block those stairs herself, preventing the other paladin from using them while fighting Silas. There. Camilla needs a stronger weapon now. Right next to you. It's my turn. I won't forget this. This paladin can attack either Silas or Camilla without dying because he has armored blood. Silas has less defense than Camilla does on paper, but his is boosted by Rose's thorns and by Vow of Friendship, since Corrin is wounded again. With those skills factored in, Silas and Camilla both have 26 defense. However, Camilla has weapon triangle advantage, so she takes two less damage than Silas will. The fact that she doubles the Paladin is probably also decisive. Only Keaton and Mozu have yet to act. They'll help against the newly arrived generals. Keaton in particular still has to find one support point with Laszlo. Azura can hitch a ride with Gunther to go south. To make her turn productive, we should give her someone to sing to. This will be enjoyable. Selena requires nearly full HP. Because she has dodged so many attacks, that only takes a heal staff, but we'll have Jacob use Mend for the sake of consistency. This one's not afraid to die. Well, I'll work some. Mozu and Xander will each weaken the left hand general for Charlotte. Look who's here! You have my aid. You're nobody! <laughs> who's next? Charlotte has made a ton of progress, with only four kills. Rally's strength is just two levels away. One way for Laszlo to earn his one support point with Keaton would be for him to attack using Keaton's dual strike. That would be really safe, since Keaton wouldn't kill the general even with a crit. I guess I'll save your tail. However, the experience Laszlo would earn as the lead attacker would take him to level six. We don't want that because we're planning to change his class, and we want him to learn his new skills as soon as possible. Instead, Keaton has to lead using Laszlo's support. Laszlo is able to deal damage when using his Steel Sword to dual strike. It's better for him to use that than his Armor Slayer. I want to see what happens. If we avoid a crit from Keaton, then we will finally be free of the RNG for the rest of the mission. Selena gets to take one more scalp on her way to level 6. Fine. Wait. 
<laughs> Lastly, it's Deja Vu with Camilla and Silas. Silas is pushing for level 5 because, like Lazo and Selena, he and Camilla are about to get married. He wants to learn Defender before he enters his fiancé's class tree. Together we shall prevail. Shall we kill them? We won't give up. Corrin has nothing to do. Percy can at least help Azura go south, and he'll be able to help chip down the bosses. You have my support. Let's see how this goes. We can do this. Not to worry. Like Selena, Camilla needs to be healed. On my honor as a knight. I live to serve. Careful out there! After all that maneuvering, Silas and Gunter are now close enough to reach their ultimate destinations. Over on the left side, our main concern is getting Selena down to the bosses with Laszlo. Let me help you. Don't do anything dumb. Charlotte can give the hammer back to Selena, who will need it for the generals. Selena has to kill them both to reach level 7. Shall we? Go, go! Let's go! The hammer is easily Selena's most powerful weapon, but it's not her best one. At the moment, she's not trying to kill the generals, She's only looking to deal damage and earn experience. Apparently she can accomplish that goal just fine by using the Bronze Lance plus two. She can save the massive hammer attacks for later. The only question is whether that's still going to happen if the generals switch, because the one in back gets weapon triangle advantage with the Silver Star Axe. The answer is no. Since generals are capped at B rank and axes, the weapon triangle can only reduce Selena's damage by one. She's already dealing two, and besides, she has strong repose. The generals are slow enough, and the Bronze Lance is accurate enough, that there's no concern about Selena missing, either. If it were absolutely necessary, Selena could use the Hand Axe plus one or even the Bronze Axe, but the former is less accurate and the latter is less powerful. The hammer is just wrong because it risks a crit. We can't forget the second treasure chest. It gives us an energy drop, which increases strength by two. If, at some point, we really have to use that to reach an important benchmark, we will. But otherwise, we might just save it for shenanigans at endgame. I won't leave. This turn will be one giant exercise in milking experience from the bosses before we kill them. Camilla will start. It's better for her to use Xander's support than Selena's. Xander's going to care about the one additional weapon experience a lot more than Selena will, and this will also give the two siblings their first support point. Camilla would rather gain axe experience than tome experience. The bolt axe does allow a 1% crit chance, but we've been pretty lucky today, right? Got your back. 
Selena can kill with the hammer, but just for fun, instead of doing this with Laszlo, we can have her pair up with Keaton. After two battles, she and Keaton will unlock their sea support. We don't want Selena to occupy the space adjacent to Camilla anymore. Without Rose's thorns, she only deals 33 damage, so the decision to make Camilla use the bolt axe wasn't entirely about subtle long-term benefits at the cost of short-term risk. If Selena weren't as strong as she is, then fire wouldn't have dealt enough damage. It's my lucky day. Now we can chip down the second general. That responsibility belongs primarily to Percy and Silas, the two boys who are grinding to level 5. and Lance's is an excellent milestone for Silas to reach. He'll be making heavy use of his new 5-point hit bonus in a couple of chapters. Azura pairs with Gunter so she can sing to Percy. Stand firm. Percy has just reached level 4, and Silas is in great shape. He's well into level 5, he's learned Defender, and he's gotten Bean Lances. He is totally ready to become a Wyvern Lord. Charlotte can hit the last boss one more time. This is why we wanted to leave the space next to Camilla open. We can still refresh Selena because we have one more unit with shelter. This will be enjoyable. Before her final battle, let's recall what Selena has done for us. She crushed those archers in chapter 10 and those knights in chapter 13. She became best friends with Baruka, and she used that friendship to become an amazing Wyvern writer, who was crucial to our efforts in the Opera House and in Percy's Paralogue. She was one of our best fighters in the Ninja Cave, right alongside Camilla. She befriended Perry, and for good measure, she even earned supports with Camilla and Odin, and now Keaton. And just look at her awesome stats. It's a real shame to lose her, but at least she's going out on top. Selena, that was your cue for a critical hit. <laughs> Let it be known that Selena's final act before retirement was the rescue of the entire Hoshiden royal family. That's a hell of a story to go home with. Not everyone will be so lucky. This ends now! Um... Contemptible fool! Excuse me? You're a disgrace!
You should have surrendered. No more hiding. <sighs> Leo. <laughs> hmm? No. No, no, no. Hey now. Hey. You're so cute. <laughs> I see. What? Huh? Mm. Did you say? Uh, unbelievable. Tell me, Prince of Nor. Makes sense. <sighs> I've got your back. How wonderful. I'm impressed. Big brother. You have my gratitude. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> That's um. Um. Oh. <sighs> Wait. Well, this had to fall apart somehow. Overall, I like what the rewrite has done with this chapter, giving Korn more agency and establishing that he has two goals, one being to negotiate peace with Ryoma and the other being to save King Garen. But come on, Korn, you had to know Garen was never going to sit on that throne without bloodshed. One of the serious limitations of this style of rewrite is that it doesn't change the gameplay content at all, so the plot is still bound to a very particular course. What? It's great to establish two different objectives for the main character that eventually come into conflict, but I wish those things could have had more time to develop before they crashed into each other. The way this is written, Korn's just making a stupid mistake. He's not consciously deciding to continue a war that will kill a lot of people just to save his father. It was established in chapter 15 that Korn was willing to do exactly that. So I wish that this moment, when the die has finally been cast, had a bit more weight. So you see, I'm sorry. Ugh. War can no longer be averted, but it can be postponed. Before chapter 19, we'll take a couple of detours. In our next mission, Selena's legacy will live on in more ways than one. See you there.